So, national measures which could see hospitality businesses shut are being considered by the UK government to slow the surge of coronavirus cases. A short period of tighter restrictions lasting a few weeks could be announced as early as this week. Schools and most workplaces are likely to be kept open during this time. Health Secretary Matt Hancock has said the government is prepared to do what it takes against COVID-19. Well, to answer your questions this afternoon, I'm joined by Dr. Sarah Pitt, a virologist from the University of Brighton, and Dr. Elisabetta Grappelli, a virologist and lecturer in global health at St. George's University in London. Thank you both uh, for joining us uh, once again. Uh, I'll go straight to the questions. We've got this one from uh, Judith uh, Nugy, who says, if we did have a mild form of COVID, would, it be, would we be infectious generally or when experiencing this recurrence would we have immunity sarah uh, yes you would be infectious um and even a mild form you of covid you are still actually shedding virus which means you could um, pass that on to other people and in terms of immunity the uh the, actually the evidence suggests that the milder you experience the the infection the less likely you are to produce a, a lasting protective immune response. So the answer to the question about immunity is possibly not, although it's not, it's not terribly clear cut. It's just if you're less likely to make a good immune response because part of the symptoms of the more serious disease is, is related to your immune response hmm. to the virus rather than the virus itself. Yeah, Elizabeth, we, we've all heard of that, that term, herd immunity, and yet we were hearing from the scientists today that uh, nine out of 10 people still haven't had this virus. Absolutely, yes. It's in some um, places, it's actually only 8% and maybe cities a little bit higher, which means that, uh, so and this is the antibody test that has, uh, uh, can tell us if people have been exposed uh, to, to the virus. And so that is, uh, is a quite a, a small minority. 92% of us are uh, still susceptible and we can obviously get infected and transmit the virus. So it's absolutely important that uh, we tackle the spread and transmission right now. Sarah, when I used that phrase, herd immunity, you, you reacted. Sarah, I was just saying that when I used the phrase herd immunity, you reacted to it. Yes. Could I please just interject? Yes. Herd immunity you, is, is really misunderstood. People are using it in completely the wrong way. Herd immunity is something which is only used in a very specific context, which is by epidemiologists who are deciding what level of vaccine cover to give to people. It is not relating to it doesn't cannot be applied to natural infection of anything so whatever it is we're talking about here it isn't herd immunity and um it cannot it can definitely cannot be achieved by natural infection for anything but it definitely won't be achieved for this coronavirus because as we've seen the at the moment the even in hotspots in places like spain where they've actually gone and done um antibody testing of people in, in healthcare workers and so on in retrospect we're up to about maybe 10 percent of people will have evidence of antibody and most of some of that will will um be lost anyway over, over the months um but even in something like measles her, we still have to vaccinate against measles and measles is very infectious and much more infectious than than covid19 virus and you actually do produce long-lasting lifelong immunity from measles and even then you don't do herd immunity through natural infection so i really would really like i would appreciate if people stopped using that term because it's they you they're misusing it well i'm glad i'm glad we cleared that up because uh, <laughs> i saw how you reacted when i used it so forgive me uh, now <laughs> let's go to another question no, it's not you. <laughs> jason barker uh, has asked i was shielding as i've got covid my question is what's happening to the shielders of this country uh, dr grappelli yeah, so, so um, the latest uh, shielding guidance has actually only been updated on the 4th of September when it reiterated that uh, although shielding was something that uh, it was advised during the peak of the pandemic, it's not something that it was is, is being required uh, uh, right now. However, there is quite a lot of attention about uh, uh, the fact that the situation is quite dynamic. So, And of course, as we know now, uh, this situation right now is quite critical. So 
So there is the possibility, of course, that, that uh, shielding advice might change. The important aspect is also that uh, NHS Digital has uh, a nice secure list of all the people who have been asked to shield during the peak of the pandemic. And so the idea is that should the guidance change, they will be immediately informed about the increased risk and, of course, the need of shielding. OK, uh, I've got this question from Anon, who I suspect has some knowledge about this. Uh, Dr Pitt, if I could put this to you, how do we ensure that the PCR swab testing is not picking up non-infectious people who still have dead virus RNA in their nose or throat from being infected some time ago? Perhaps we should start by explaining exactly what the PCR swab is. Yes, OK. So there's a very interesting question, actually. So PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction, and that's just the technical term for the test which they're doing for the virus. So if people have a swab collected, it goes off to a lab, and that's just the technical term of the, of the test which they, which they use to detect the virus. Um, and as this, this questioner says, they're mentioning RNA, which is the genetic material of the virus. Now, RNA doesn't tend to hang around for too long in the human body. We tend to have processes which will, um, de well, which will uh, make it decay. So you're unlikely to have virus hanging around or evidence of virus hanging around from uh, infection from a long time ago. But you, if you're at the very, very end of your, your fortnightly um, or three weekly sort of infectious period, you, it's possible that you might have a low level of um, virus uh, detect, you know, that the, the test will pick up, that you might not be infectious to other people. However, the, the, they get around that by setting um, setting the parameters of the test so that they if they decide something's positive, they one or two copies of the, the genetic material of the virus would not um, be reported as a positive test. So it's the way they set the test up, which makes sure that doesn't happen um, or is less likely to happen. But also, you know, the, the person can be rest assured that RNA doesn't hang around from month to month. So um, that's also kind of unlikely as well. But that, that's what they do. It's kind of they set up this test in a technical way to kind of account for that possibility. But the, the, test, I hope that helps. the test just tells you if you've got it or you haven't got it, doesn't it? I mean, yes. it doesn't tell you how strongly you've got it or how infectious it, you may be. Uh, well, it can do. We can actually, we could do that. We don't, because at the moment we're just deciding, do you have it or do you not have it? But the way the test actually, the test um, sort of the testing system works is the same way. It's the same test that we use to test whether someone with something like hepatitis B or HIV, whether the drugs that they're on is actually working. And we do look for, for a thing. Some of your um, viewers might be aware of a term called viral load, which is the amount of virus that you actually have. The, the PCR test can um, look at that. But in the case of the COVID-19 testing, what we're doing at the moment is just you either do have it or you don't have it. But we can set a threshold to, do, to make that decision. So if there's a couple of copies of it hanging around, we might we probably call that negative. OK, well, thank you for that. Now, uh, Dr. Grappelli, uh, this one from David Johnson. If immunity to coronavirus faded over months, how will this impact the potential success of vaccination? Right, so this is a very interesting question. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, naturally infection, uh, we might generate a short-term uh, immunity. But the vaccines actually might work differently. And because also they are designed specifically to generate immunity, they tend to take that into consideration. So uh, just uh, uh, without going into, into the details, but uh, the, the, the vaccine is actually very different, uh, you know, genetically and also looks a little bit different. So, and it is administered uh, often with some uh, uh, chemicals that actually can boost an, an, immune, an immune response. And also there are, uh, there are two types of, of immunity that is actually required uh, against the coronavirus that is very important and actually the, the, uh, the vaccines do stimulate both arms of the immune system. So actually both of them are involved in what is called the memory so that uh, you know, immunity can be built up when we come into contact with the, uh, with the virus after uh, vaccination. So uh, different technology, natural immunity, uh, not necessarily long-lasting. Sometimes when it comes to virus vaccines, unfortunately, the vaccines are not that good and need to be administered uh, every year, for example. And this is the case for the flu vaccine. It's not just about the viruses being different. Uh, 
but also needing to to, to boost. So there is a good hope, certainly for all the by uh, all the technologies for the vaccines that are being developed. Uh, but only one thing will tell, uh, which is actually time. If we want to know how long something biological lasts, we're going to have to wait. Sarah, you were nodding away. Yes, and I, and I think it's probably worth bearing in mind that it's quite likely, I think, that we may have to have annual boosters or six monthly boosters, at least in the, in the short term, um, while we're waiting for the virus to kind of settle down and, and hopefully go away altogether, um, just because of the very nature of the, of the vaccines themselves and the uh, body's immune response to mm. them. Well, let me just pick you up on that, because the next question from Stephen Evans says, will the virus ever die out naturally of its own accord? Well, you see, the, the 2002 SARS did, it just went away. And the reason for that was because we had very stringent um, infection control measures, which actually stopped transmission of the virus from person to person, and we managed to get rid of it that way. So it is entirely possible um, that it would, we could stop it passing from person to person. But what that requires is for us to be really strict about our social distancing measures and uh, to stop the transmission um, spreading around. And also because now we know, because we know that some people who are um, infectious but they don't have any symptoms, they can spread it to other people, which in SARS-1, that was not very common. Whereas with, with, with SARS-2, it does seem to be common. And also, um, it, SARS-1 didn't spread around the whole world in the same, to the same extent that this one has. Um, so it's entirely possible, and I think it's in, in humanity's hands to do that, but whether it's actually log logistically possible is another question, I think. But I'd like, it, I'd like to see us get rid of it altogether. Yes, I mean, looking at Elisabetta Grappelli, looking at how things are at the moment, that, that, that's just looking like a wish. Yes. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, that seems to be the case. I mean, the, the, the thing about this novel coronavirus is that it spreads very efficiently, as a, um, and as Sarah has pointed out, it also can spread before symptoms or without symptoms, and that makes it very, very difficult to, to tackle uh, as a you know public health threat. So, and I'll just point out that the last, uh, the only two times actually that we've managed to make two viruses disappear, so small smallpox and, a, and an animal virus, was because we had fantastic vaccines and also a global uh, vaccination campaign that was yeah. very, very efficient. So certainly hopes, but right now it doesn't, need, doesn't look like it's the case. So we are mm. going down to the good old uh, uh, measures of keeping distance and washing hands. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr Pitt, this one from Ray Fryer. Can the COVID-19 test distinguish between types of flu and COVID, and if so, how? Well, I think it's worth bearing in mind that COVID-19 is not a type of flu. And in terms of the virus, the viruses, they are completely different. So the COVID-19 test that we're using at the moment just tests for COVID-19 and nothing else. So it's very, as we've said earlier on the programme, it's looking for the, for the genetic material, which is like the unique barcode of that virus. And it will only pick that up. So if the person has a flu or another type of respiratory infection, it won't come up positive on the COVID-19 test as it stands at the moment. Now, as we're going forward into the winter, what the hospital laboratories certainly will be doing is a, a, a form of the, of the PCR test where you can test for lots of different viruses all at once. Now, this is standard practice. We've been doing it this way for um, quite a number of years now, that you have one, one swab or one, you know, one throat swab or one throat um, sample, and you put it in a, in a test tube and you can test for lots and lots of different respiratory viruses all in one go. And because you're looking for the unique barcode of each virus, it can tell the difference between um, influenzas. There is influenza A, influenza B, and it can tell um, another thing called respiratory syncytial virus, which is quite important in, in particularly in children. And it would be able to tell the difference between um, uh, uh, the, the COVID-19 virus, it will also, some setups will also distinguish normal common cold coronaviruses as well. So um, the person, the question can be rest assured that we can tell the difference in the laboratory between all these different viruses actually quite easily now. The technology is there and the, the, the science and the expertise is definitely there to do that. Right. Um, Elizabeth, I've got a question here from Chris Wren, which I don't think he's finished. Uh, he says, is it not highly irresponsible for universities, especially ones located in special measures areas, 
and that's it. I think he probably means to open this week and bring everybody from around the country into an area that looks fairly risky. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, yes, I would interpret it in, in that way as well. Yes. <laughs> there is certainly uh, reasons to be concerned and sort of being very attentive about what happens on campus because it's actually this is not novel. We know that when students come back to campus, all sorts of uh, uh, viruses, respiratory viruses especially, go up in terms of cases and infections. So certainly this year we also have uh, the major threat of uh, this novel coronavirus. But it's also we need to take into consideration that the universities have spent the summer months uh, making campus and also the courses uh, COVID secure and most universities actually have adopted uh, a combination of lectures online but also maintaining giving the possibility to the students to actually come on campus to do uh, the practicals that are so important for many degree courses including medicines for example uh, but of course university life uh, goes beyond uh, teaching and learning and this I think when it's very important to uh, give the responsibility, reminded of the, the individual's responsibility to every single student. Uh, COVID remind us that uh, it's not just about us as individuals, but also the potential transmissions and effects uh, that we have onto our peers and our and the rest of society. So on campus especially, is that it will be important for universities as authorities to play their part, but also for the individuals uh, to behave absolutely fantastically because as we know, even if you are still young and it might experience only mild symptoms, you can still be part of the transmission chains. Yeah, as Sarah, I've not been to Brighton for a while, I've not been young for a while, but I mean, <laughs> there is an issue, particularly with Freshers' Week, isn't there? Well, there is, but um, as Elizabeth said, the universities are, have made the campuses COVID secure as is, as is possible, and we're giving our students um, all the guidance and all the support which they would need to, to stay safe. And I think we do have to trust them. I think we have to understand that um, if we give them all the information and uh, explain to them what they can and can't do or what they should and shouldn't do, then um, then allow them to make those kind of decisions. I think, it, And I think in the long term, it's better if we say don't if this is this is what you should be doing and allow them to get on with it and then intervene if we have to if if something's gone wrong somewhere rather than assuming that it's going to go wrong because they're not going to be able to um follow the rules because they're young and they're going to go they're just going to come down to have fun because there's nothing wrong with having fun but all of us are having to have fun in a COVID secure kind of way. And at the moment, at the moment, this, the situation is the rule of six. So we're socialising with six people um, and we're all having to do that. Um, it's, have you intervened, it's Sarah? Have you have you actually gone up to a group of students and said you, c you shouldn't be doing that? Oh, no, I didn't mean that. I meant um, have a um, <laughs> infection control sort of a, if there's a out outbreak somewhere, we would have to do public health intervention. That's sorry, that's what I meant. No, but, I, but um, if you did, if you this week go back to the university campus and there are yes. se seven or eight people breaking a couple of rules, what would you say? I might, I might go up to them and explain to them um, uh, or sort of, you know, kind of ask them what, what, what was happening and maybe explain to them in a, a... I have actually been known to tell students off for talking outside examination rooms and they surprised... It surprised me, actually, that they actually listened and, and thought, oh, yes, sorry, and moved away from the exam. So, actually, I might... I, I might... I always think I don't have the the sort of gravitas that people will take notice of me, but they do occasionally. Oh, come on. Uh, if I feel, feel strongly about it, they do <laughs> sometimes listen to me. Well, if they said, who do you think you are, you'd just say, I'm Dr Sarah Pitt, virologist. Why? Yes, <laughs> that, that's right, and I would be confident about that, and I think I'd probably have to carry it off, yes. Yeah, no, of course, that's great. <laughs> now, um, let, let's, let's move on. Elizabeth, this is from Laura Monty. What are the scientists' views on current use of masks and could it be made more effective? Aha. Right, the masks are topic, and I feel actually I should, as a scientist, uh, I should start with uh, possibly an apology, because we have been caught on the back foot when it came to, to masks, so we've never had to pop, pop, uh, properly put them in the context of uh, uh, large-scale infection prevention control. But right now, actually, you know, the, the evidence is that masks uh, do play a part, face covering uh, do play a part, and we, we should absolutely uh, put it in place. In terms of making that more effective, 
effective. Well, the best way actually to make a mask effective is wearing it properly, wearing it correctly, which means that it needs to fit and also that you shouldn't touch it. Um, but also wear it properly means that it actually has to cover the nose and the mouth. And unfortunately, there have been examples on campus and on hospitals as well of different alternative way of, of wearing a mask. So definitely, definitely a reminder that the most effective way is covering both nose and mask and not touching it and washing hands before but also after uh, you have to take it off okay. and store it or, or change it frequently. Lovely. I've got time for one very quick one. Uh, I'll put this to you, Sarah, from Zara Alitsi. Could there be other factors of the immune system that need to be considered other than antibodies? Yes, I mean, I think it's quite clear that another bit of the immune system, uh, there's a type of uh, cell in the blood called white blood cells. There's a particular type of white blood cell which is involved in uh, the uh, immune response called a T cell. And that clearly is involved in immunity to coronavirus in a way that um, perhaps we hadn't quite realised at the very beginning because we normally concentrate on on, on antibodies when we're looking at um, trying to protect ourselves against infection. OK. Um, so, yes. Yes, good. Uh, we'll, we'll end with a yes. Uh, Dr Sarah Pitt and Dr Elisabetta Grappelli, it's really good to talk to you both and, and fascinating. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks.